John, uh, I'll, I'll hand over to you and um, thank you for introducing yourself and thank you so much for presenting. OK, hi. Um, I'm a contemporary lecturer, sorry, lecturer in contemporary art at Sydney College of the Arts. Um, I'm a primarily work in the digital sphere and have been working in that way since about 1985. Um, lately, I've been doing some big public art projects, but I'm kind of shifting gears lately and kind of moving into virtual reality. And well, I've been doing that for a couple of years now, but um, earlier this year was the first time that I, I taught a subject based around this. And um, in many ways, I feel what I'm presenting today is feels a bit different to what other people are doing. It's very pedagogical, pedagogically orientated and um, kind of field notes from my experiences of teaching this for the first time. Anyway, before I continue, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay respects to their elders past and present. So this was a unit that I proposed quite a few years ago, but the pandemic would slow down to that. Um, virtual reality in particular is not a good look during a respiratory pandemic. Um, I had some work in a show in Wollongong at the end of last year that halfway through they took my work out because of, um, they didn't think it was safe, which I was totally in agreement with. Anyway, this subject was developed with input from my colleague Marcus Carter in the um, Department of Media and Communications at Sydney Uni. And it was designed for a really broad range of students. So it was designed for Sydney College of the Arts students, but it was also designed for students doing film production, also within Sydney College of the Arts, but also media production, design, computing, architecture, etc. And we did get a really broad range of students doing it. So I just thought, part of my introduction, I'd just show some examples of my work over the years, but in particular, I'm focusing here on ones where I'm working with real-time 3D graphics. So I, sorry. Again, I was a fairly early adopter of all this stuff, but um, actually the image on the left there was an animation, but the one on the right was an interactive work. Um, this work, st Strange Weather, was kind of an early version of the quantified self. I was, it was a kind of, celebration and orgy of data and people were tracking their data and they were able to correlate it with various global data. But so I'm really keen and excited to get students thinking about real time 3D and and doing that within a VR space. I've been working with VR for about three years and um, I'm really fascinated by the possibilities, but also the problematics of these technologies. This is a VR portrait that I'm developing of Adelaide based writer Francesca Drumini. And this is the work that I showed in Wollongong at the end of last year. So this was a work that visualizes ambisonic recordings of bird calls at dusk. Ambisonics is a technique for capturing three-dimensional sound fields that can be used to create highly spatialized audio and VR experiences. The work sought out to speculatively situate the audience within a, the sensory world of birds by imagining a visual representation of the three-dimensional soundscapes as a kind of unfolding spatial, spatio-temporal syn synesthesia. So, I'm actually incorporating a little bit of media studies into this lecture and because many of the issues that I had teaching and many of the um, things I kind of want to discuss relate to media studies. So I just thought I would introduce you to, the, and maybe some of you have heard of this, the, the circuit of culture. It, the circuit of culture is a framework in which a cultural object, the archetypal example being the Sony Walkman, is viewed from five interlinked positions, production, consumption, regulation, representation, and identity. So 
this terminology is a little un different, I think, to what a visual art context would expect. But representation here is really talking about the content, the products, that, the things that are being made and how they're representing. But today I really am going to be focusing on tools of production and um, means of consumption. Um, so various um, thinkers have suggested that this um, image of, of culture needs to be updated for software-based culture. So for Nickel and Keo, they suggest that software tools configure the very circuitry that underpins capital, labor, and creativity in today's economy. In software culture, surplus value is generated from an interplay between informal and formal modes of human capital in a way that is consonant with a broader neoliberalization of work and subjectivity. So while um, the canonical example of that was used in, in, in that previous diagram was the Sony Walkman. Perhaps the Sony PlayStation is a more insightful case study for contemporary software culture, as it is a media ecology where the tools of production, distribution, and consumption are all tightly controlled by Sony. As Kia et al. write, throughout much of, his, of its history, the game industry has been a proving ground for various techniques of platformiz platformization many of which have filtered out into other areas of media production, distribution, and consumption. Both the razor, razor and blades approach, selling hardware at a loss and recouping revenue through software sales, and the notion of a walled garden platform ecosystem were perfected by video game consoles manufacturers in the 1980s and 1990s. And Sony was the ultimate example of that. So the MetaQuest is by far the most VR headset released today. Marcus Carter and Ben Eggleston argue that Reality Lab's actions over 2018-2022 reveal a vision for, for a spatial computing future where its technologies are integrated and pardon me, are integrated widely across economy and society, from software development to use in business. A dynamic of what Planton would call Inf infrastructuralization. By this, they refer to the way that platforms take on a central role in society, such that society becomes dependent on them to function. Meta, so Meta is Facebook and owns Oculus, which is now called Meta. Um, Meta has stated that they plan to invest 10 million a year to make their vision for the metaverse successful. This figure is likely to be under review as Meta and other technology stocks have fallen dramatically in, in recent times. And in fact, I checked today, Meta has fallen 25% in the last 24 hours. So things are not going well. So how, do, how does an artist get their VR work out into the world? So in terms of the Quest platform, which is the dominant platform, initially the only option for distributing content was through the Meta App Store which was tightly controlled to main, maintain a high quality experience for customers. Part, you know, partly that was justifiable because of VR's capacity to make users feel unwell. Meta has a raft of technical requirements to avoid this, but also the store was dominated by mainstream commercial game genres, perhaps motivated by Meta's 30% cut of revenue. They needed to sell blades to pay for the raises. More recently, they have introduced the App Lab, which is a less regulated sorry, which is less regulated and allows for more diverse experimental content. Over the last 12 months, I've noticed more art projects and other diverse forms of content have made, made their way onto the Quest platform. But for my own practice, I decided quite a while ago to circumvent all of this issue with app stores acting as gatekeepers. And so I've been working with WebXR. So WebXR is a, a fairly recent standard, which allows you to do to develop VR and AR experiences that, are that run on the web. As long as a VR hardware has a WebXR capable web browser, you're able to run the content. So for the class, we offered students two main focuses. One of them was um, shooting 360 and 180 video and editing that together in Adobe Premiere. 
So a fairly um, traditional workflow that's very familiar to our um, filmmaking and media students. But for the, the real-time VR, we decided to use web-based tools. And this paper is really focused around that. Students were introduced to both these approaches and could choose where to focus their energies. So this, the class structure was three hours a week. There were two main assessments plus a research blog. For project one, we introduced students to Guy Dubois' concept of psychogeography and the idea of capturing the essence of a space. This seemed to resonate with the students, and many of them built on this for the self-directed project. So I've got some images. I have some video later on, but it's actually quite difficult to capture video of the artworks. Um, so this is a local student who was um, working actually in the SCA, Old Teachers College. This is a, another student, Oliver Ewan, and he was trying to recapture memories of a space that he hadn't visited for 20 or so years. So he was kind of retracing steps that he had done as a, ch a child. Uh, quite a lot of these works involve voiceover, and I, I was really encouraging him to use voiceover to kind of add other layers of, of content and meaning to the works. So I'm going to be getting a little bit technical at times, but bear with me. So when people are talking about technology of in a platform sense, often they talk about layers. It's kind of a geographical, sorry, geological metaphor. And so in this particular students, will, I'm sorry, the technologies start at the bottom. WebXR is kind of the lowest level. And then they layered on top of that. So the tools at the top are built on the other tool, are built on the other libraries. So for my own work, I've been working with 3.js, which is fairly nerdy kind of environment where you're basically programming. Um, A-frame is a kind of easier tag-based version of that. And but we primarily focused on Mozilla Hubs and Spoke, which is an application primarily used for um, social it's a it's a it's a social software but it allows you to customize it so we were using the customization features to build a mozilla hubs is an open source 3d web-based social space that can be viewed using a mobile or desktop browser or in vr goggles this meant that students were able to view their work as they developed it regardless of whether they had access to a vr headset so we had we were running two classes one class was remote and one class was in person. Um, the vast majority of the remote students were in China. And at the time when this was happening, many of those students were in lockdown and you know, fairly intense lockdowns. Uh, so on the right hand is one of the students' works that I'll show you later on. Um, Mozilla Hubs is, oh, sorry, Mozilla Spoke is um, an open source web-based tool for assembling 3D content images and audio into a hub scene. So this is a really easy to use tool and students were able to use this to generate content pretty quickly. It's a great tool. If students want to go further and, and do more advanced stuff, they can, but they can get something together fairly quickly. So other stuff that we were using, and again, I'm focusing here on the real-time VR, um, low-end 3D scanning. So in the last couple of years, Quite a lot of apps have come out for phones. The, the latest iPhones have sensors in them, which allow you to, to do quite rough 3D scans. And you know, I encourage students to use phone-based 3D scanning um, rather than spending a lot of time modeling in um, uh, 3D software. Um, some other students used photogrammetry software called Meshroom, also open source, to create 3D models as well. Then the other tool that we used a lot was Blender. So Blender is a free and open source 3D modeling and animation software. Um, Blender is a complex and intimidating software tool. We deliberately focused on just a small part of its functionality, using it to clean up and optimize the 3D models that the students scanned. Um, 
and that's why we kind of really focused on the scanning. But again, some students did do modeling and, and more assembled, more advanced content was in Blender. Um, I don't think I'll even talk about this. This is the tool that allows you um, students to go even further and customize stuff in Blender. So I just wanted to reflect a little bit on the tools that we were doing before I'll show you some examples. Um, so, and, and quite a lot of what I'm going to be talking about here comes out of game studies and, and scholars who are writing about games. And I did quite a lot of research in the last few weeks trying to find that I, I couldn't find anyone who was um, writing about teaching VR in a visual arts context. And in fact, I didn't find much about teaching VR at all. Most, most stuff that I found was about using VR for education, but not about education or VR production. Um, anyway, um, primarily most VR um, experiences are being created using game engines. And probably the one being used most is Unity, but there's also Unreal Engine. And I kind of just want to talk a little bit about industry standard tools versus more accessible tools. Um, so if I'd used one of a tool like Unity for this subject, then the teaching of that tool would have dominated the curriculum and not allowed time for students to develop their work conceptually. Um, so it was a really very definite decision of mine, but there were a couple of students in the class who were familiar with Unity and, and other tools like that. And, you know, I could tell to start with that they were a little bit disparaging about working with these um, easy to use tools, but they actually kind of came around and I, I was able to articulate some why we were working with what we were working the way that we were. Um, just as a bit of a critique of Unity, so there's been you know, a couple of scholars who've analysed how Unity really affords particular types of games and workflows. So it pushes makers towards making um, more mainstream games, um, shooting games, but all, you know, also other sorts of games that are very goal orientated and you know, there's a whole lot of architecture there that, that, that does that. There are also workflows that are particularly designed for teams that include a programmer. And yeah, that's all right. Um, Brendan Keogh, who's an Australian game scholar, um, interviewed a whole lot of game makers and about the tools that they were using. And, you know, a lot of independent games developers didn't want to work with Unity. They preferred working with their own tools or with more simple tools. Um, one of them said that they found a sense of empowerment through the explicit limitation of tools rather than a promise of endless freedom. And I think, you know, um, teaching in a visual art context, I think we all appreciate the freedom that constraints give students. Um, as Keo succinctly articulates, this leads us to the second side of the equation of video game craft. Video game makers do not just work within the realm of what's possible with a tool or what they are able to do with that tool, but also what is expected for them to do with that tool. So um, some other scholars, including Ben Nickel, has, have written about Unity and compared it with tools like Twine. So Twine is a web-based tool for creating interactive fiction that has been used by minorities, in particular LGBTQIA communities, to make games. And often these are you know, relatively simple games, but with really interesting content. Um, Nichols has described Twine you know, drawing from Deleuze as being a minor platform, that, as opposed to um, Unity being more of a major platform. Okay, now this is a video. Sorry, I, I, I was really in two minds, but let me know. I'm very, I've not really done Sean work like this before in, in this sort of forum, whether this makes you feel sick. It's, it's quite difficult to capture VR and the field of view feels much bigger when you're actually in VR, whereas this 
feels quite tunnel vision. I mean, VR is kind of tunnel vision, but anyway, let me know how it goes. This was a work made by a student in, um, I think, Beijing, who was in lockdown and um, found herself spending a lot of time in her bathroom to kind of avoid what things that she was meant to be doing. And so she's built a space where there's two bathrooms. There's a bathroom reflected in the mirror and you're able to move between those two spaces. And the sound very much kind of describes what she's going through and kind of the, the negative side of, of her avoidance. This was a Sydney-based student and a little bit similar, but in the, in the sense that there's kind of this real sense of containment. And in fact, like the previous work, I feel really nicely engaged with the claustrophobia that is somewhat a part of VR. Um, this work, you're, you're trapped in this series of rooms and there, there is no exit. Um, the student scanned many objects of her life and it's kind of constructed these composite objects. You can she, see she really played with scale and and just kind of mess. There's like a whole lot of dirty dishes all composited together and all sorts of stuff. Um, students are able to position audio in 3D space. So often, for example, with this work, they position their different parts of their voiceover in different rooms. So as you move through, you would hear different parts. Right. All right. Okay. Um, I just wanted to summarise by kind of talking about a few issues and things to watch out for and possible future directions. So the lab was not 100% successful on a technical level. There were some pretty big problems actually and part of that was because they bought into a technology, an earlier version of the quests, an enterprise version that was then discontinued. And so we, it made it very difficult to actually work with the headsets in the way that I would have liked to have. Um, but one of the things that's really important and that IT people don't necessarily understand, are you guys ever accessing me? I seem to be really hiccuping here. No, it's perfectly great oh, uh, online. Okay. Going on, yeah. Good. Um, I had to really push the point with them that being able to view 
um, existing example com content is really important. They hadn't allowed for that at all. So the original version that they had, you couldn't actually install existing work from the world. And as I was saying before, increasingly a lot of um, artists work, they are putting work out and making it accessible. So, you know, that was a really important part of the class. Um, uh, uh, kind of, that's kind of a fairly extreme one, a fairly minor, but again, something that really messes with the class, batteries. The um, most modern VR headsets are untethered, so they work. Um, they, they have batteries, they need to be charged and the batteries go flat. It was a real pain. In Um, yeah, wh when I turn this into a paper, I will include a whole lot of examples of exemplars because I think that's really useful and I've been kind of doing research around that for a few years now. Um, just sort of moving forward, I just wanted to talk about, so WebXR I think is really exciting because it has the promise of the web in what is otherwise a fairly gated world. Um, there are tensions between open and closed platforms and I'm just going to be really Talk about this really quickly, but the there's a team that's developing the browser on the Quest, and they are incredibly open. Like they talk about what they're doing on Twitter and other platforms, and they're really great um, open source. Well, no, sorry, they're not open source, but they're very good um, community citizens. But you know, the Facebook and Meta in a bigger picture, I think we're all rightfully quite suspicious of, and so it it it's good happen that they see WebXR as a threat and they want to channel more content through means that they can control and also make revenue from. Um, another issue that will really change things is um, the direction that Apple takes. So Apple has been rumoured for years now to be re releasing their own um, VR headset just around the corner, um, but they haven't communicated anything. But a couple of months ago, the chairperson of the immersive group that runs WebXR joined Apple as an employee. And I find it very difficult to believe that she wouldn't have done that if, if they weren't going to be supporting this stuff. Okay, just my last comments. So um, reflections on how I would change things next year. Um, I would better articulate my thinking around the choice of platform and so the, the choice of working with these um, accessible open tools. We didn't really take advantage of the social aspects of hubs, like we were really just using hubs as a way to create content, but we did do a little bit of that. And when I was marking with Sarah Cashman, who I was teaching this, some, often we would go in there from our respective houses and look at the works that way, which is actually really cool. Um, shared cohort. So this we had students who were at a master's level who were doing film production and we had undergraduate visual arts students, as well as a smattering of other students. I find it really interesting the different, the way that those different students think about group work. And, you know, especially given that the visual art world has moved on from the notion of the singular genius, I, I think that in future I'll encourage the um, visual arts students to, to do group work. It's, it's a lot to take on this project, and I think that that could really help them. Um, oh, the last thing, and this kind of relates to the, the theme of this conference it, about public learning, is, is that I, at the moment my content is on Canvas, which is effectively on a walled garden that only students can access. And so I want to start putting not all of the content, but you know, more of the technical content in a way that's accessible to other artists and other students who might want to learn. Okay, I'll wrap up there.